Hi, uh, welcome to the bathtub. This is Scott Bradfield, and we are asking the, the perennial question, um, can great books and can not so great books be read pleasurably in the bathtub? And this week, we're going to uh, discuss one of my favorite writers for reading anywhere, but particularly in the bathtub, and that's Samuel Beckett. Thought we take a, we're taking a bit of a leap here, but um, he's one of those writers I... I I always return to, I return to fairly regularly. I get a great ple deal of pleasure just reading the stuff he does. Um, I think that like many of the writers we've talked about in these, these, these talks is that he has been surrounded with a lot of seriosity, a lot of you know m magnificence of genius and all these, these rubbish words that don't help anybody. I don't th know if he was a genius. I don't personally think he was a genius. Um, he was a he was a, or, or a super genius of any sort. He's not. Uh, um, he he has uh, peculiar interests and he has particular obsessions when he writes. But uh, you don't. I don't think you need to read him to learn about the meaning of the human condition. That's another thing that's attributed to him. What are they always talking? They're saying all this bullshit. Um, he, he's uh, he brings forth the body of beauty. Um, He's, um, who's this guy? He's always saying, he's teaching us what will grow in the wasteland. This huge monumental idea, supposedly, in, in Beckett. And I think that's, like most good reading and most good writers, I think that's just the wrong way to approach these people, as if they're these edifices and we're going to get underneath and understand these great figures above us. Uh, Beckett's right down on the human level, which is what I really like about it. He's right there with you. And possibly, so he's, if anywhere, he's a little lower than you. He's pretty down there. <laughs> I don't know how to say it more than that. And so this week, I thought we one of the things we're trying to do in these series is, is um, you know, basically follow what people do when they read, or at least what I do when I read. And I've mentioned this before, variety and repetition. So I like to change. I like to have a different re a writer every so often. Um, there are certain writers I like to go back to. Beckett's one of them. And I thought I'd set up another little chain of readings over the uh, till the end of the world, which is which is almost here uh, with um, with Beckett, and and this would be the first episode. Uh, two two brief things. Um, I, I I play with the idea of throwing a lot of books out here again today, but I think I've thrown away most of my books about Beckett. I I, I can't imagine any of them were much use. And I've read lots of bad books about Beckett, and they're pretty uninteresting. One great book about Beckett is this biography, James Nolson's biography from 20 years ago or something. And it's a wonderful read, really well written, really clear, um, really no nonsense, really about the man, what he was like, what his life was like. Um, and I, I can't recall it totally, but he, he was clearly a, an intellectual man, a bit of a loner, isolated from his family, clearly depressed, had some depressive issues and some obsessive issues, um, and went through, um, went to, to Paris and lived in Paris during the occupation and was involved with the resistance. And it's, it's possible, quite possible, that he went through a real period of trauma and stress during the occupation, I guess he and his wife, and again, I'm imperfectly recalling everything in my life and everything I read. As I recall, he and his wife or partner um, were living somewhere in the villages out in, in, in France, hiding from the Nazis because they were involved in resistance. And I think they really thought they might be killed. And, and this obsession with waiting for Godot or waiting for something to come get you is not... Uh, is not an intellectual or philosophical concern for Beckett. It's actual life he's worried about. Um, I wanted to start just because I was. These are the ones I wanted to read next. Two books I really like, particularly this one, and this one I'm liking more and more. Uh, th these are published in various ways in various editions, and the ones I have are ones called The Expelled and Other Novellas. I'd like to talk about that title in a little bit, and then. Another one called Text for Nothing. Excuse me, I think I'm, I don't, I'm sure this is not new. I'm going to blow my nose on a literary. <sighs> Very terrible allergies today. Text for Nothing, which I sort of liked, but I really liked this time through. I read it three or four times, and this time through I liked it even more than I have in the past. These have been published together. You can, they, I think they were published originally in France um, at a time after Waiting for Godot came out in 53. 
and made made um, Beckett very famous very quickly, and deserved to. It's a hilarious play. It's very funny and very uh, upsetting play, and it made him very famous. And he became kind of the the, the darling of the existentialists and the, and the intellectuals. And they started publishing a lot of the stuff he had written over during the war. So I think most of this was written in the 40s and 50s. The Expelled are long story. They're just stories. I don't, the reason they call them novellas, I think, or short novels, they do this a lot with Beckett's late work. They're very short. He really pairs everything down. He, write, he publishes a lot of very slender volumes, sometimes just one or two stories at a time. And uh, this is about four stories of about 90 pages long that are basically short stories, but by calling them novellas, they make, they make them seem bigger than they are. They're very small stories, and they're very paired back stories, and they're very funny and powerful stories. Texts for Nothing are much shorter, so they're each about two or three pages. A little harder to get into. I think this is a good place to start with Beckett these four stories, especially the first story, First Love, which is hilarious. Text for Nothing is a little bit more obsessive. It's much more minute in the focus of each story. And it's also a bit of a, um, I don't want to use the, I'm going to use the word harbinger. I hate harbinger or whatever the hell that word is. It's something that, it, it tells us what he's going to do in the future. Uh, these, these very small sculpted pieces. And they're all basically, uh, like the first one, reflections of a character. I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but they're, they're often published in different editions. They're sometimes published together. Um, you can get them in a big volume of collected prose of Beckett. I like to keep Beckett in small, in small packages. Uh, not because um, I think they're incredibly dense, because they're not. They're not hard to read. But there's something quite... Uh, coherent about each thing he does. And they're, um, you don't want to read them as if you're learning some intellectual secret. That's, that's not the way to read them. They're little, compact, very um, intense stories. They're stories. They're narrative. And they're quite absorbing when you get into them. There's a, He does a number of things I just want to talk a little bit about. The first thing is, again, watch out. Don't read any criticism on Beckett at all. Uh, he's, he's, you can, I don't want to talk about his plays at all because you can get the plays. You can, uh, there's, there's a few editions of it. Uh, you should watch Rating for Godot or any of it. I have somewhere I have the complete stage work of, of Beckett that was produced for the BBC about 10, 20 years ago. It's really worth having if you, if you don't have it. But I don't want to talk about that because the things that he does on the stage, cutting back, paring back what's presented to you limiting the story to one, almost one event, waiting for somebody to get there, obviously, but then someone does come along, and this kind of, this extended process of expectation of something that's going to happen. He takes you, like, almost one step at a time, particularly in some of the narrative stories, where almost you're slowing down. As the story goes, you're actually just slowing down like in Malloy, which is a terrific novel of his. And as the story goes, there's, a only, there's only a very thin premise of a narrative. These stories are a good example in that they're almost all the same. So he, he tells the same stories over and over. They almost all start with a central character being pushed out of somewhere. So, for example, in the first story... It's about a man whose father, who's remembering his father's death, and who goes to a funeral, who goes to a, who goes to see his father's cemetery, and this again, this basic narrative premise: I associate, rightly or wrongly, my marriage with the death of my father in time. That other links exist on other levels between these two affairs is not impossible. I have enough trouble as it is in trying to say what I think. I know. Saying what I think I know is what almost all of these stories are about. So we start with this basic idea that the father's dead, and by going to visit the father and sitting on his bench every day, he meets this old kind of horrific kind of woman, and he goes home with her. There's no specificity in Beckett. 
So there's the bench, there's the park, there's the gravestone, there's the, I think there, he's constantly eating, you know, when he moves into the woman's house, it's like there's two rooms and there's a kitchen. So he pairs everything back. We often don't have a name for the characters. But there is a process in the story. And something like First Love, where he goes from the grave of his father to this next event in his life, is a pretty big event for a Beckett story. Many of the stories are just so slender, this, this event. And he moves into this woman's house, and at one point he's asking for parsnips. Every day he wants a parsnip to eat. <laughs> it's, like it's Beckett. Everything is, is late, is, is just down to this level of elemental things. Everyone's got a hat. Um, everyone's got you know the clothes that they're given. Uh, they always have shoes with holes in them. There's always some some idea of some shoes. Sometimes, if they're lucky, they have a bicycle. So this is incredibly rudimentary world, and it's it's basically the progress of this kind of lost soul trying to move forward in life, which of course they almost never do because they're moving into this. They're moving through this basic world of crap in a way, and most of the things that are beautiful to them are a bit illusory. Now, having said all that, it sounds incredibly depressing. But it's, I find him really kind of a fascinating and pleasurable writer. I don't, I don't find him depressing at all. I remember seeing, um, is it Happy Happy Days, which is an extraordinary play. So this was with my son in London. One of the best things I ever saw in theater. Uh, I think it was, I want to forget, say her name's Julie Walters. I forget her name. The woman who plays uh, this woman who's basically in a pile of garbage. And it's just her head sticking above it. And she's talking about all the good things she's going to do tomorrow morning. <laughs> she's like, I'm awake. I'm awake. I'm going to do something today. And it's just this, this sense of being mired in the, in the reality of the world and having this head that keeps trying to make you go somewhere else. It's incredibly funny. And it's also kind of, it's not, in, it's not positive. There's nothing positive about it. But it's almost like, you know, yes, we all just get up every day. And it makes, it, you really feel a real visceral. I really feel a visceral connection when you read Beckett. Um, in the same way that you would with any good writer. They all aspire to get up and go do something. I remember at the end of Happy Days, the husband <laughs> he's in a hole. <laughs> he's a hole. If you see the get chance in this play, her husband's like in a hole. And, he, and at the end of the play, basically, he gets up and he, I think he just crawls across the stage. <laughs> And this, this woman is this woman is talking about oh look he's doing look how well he's doing he's doing really well. There's a lot of that in Beckett of these people going you know we got up we did the job and we should feel good that we got through the day. So most of his stories are like that, and uh, there's a lot of stuff about basic bodily functions. There's lots of shitting and pissing, and there's lots of eating of just really unpleasant and not particularly exciting food, but just to stay alive and sustaining yourself. And all four of these stories are quite are basically sort of similar. The entire premise of the rest of the stories is not really going to see your dead father. But that, that's a pretty adventurous setup for, for a Beckett story. The others are basically people being thrown out of houses, and I think one's actually dies, one who's dies. And they basically just going in through this world, trying to find where they want to go. And it doesn't really lead them anywhere particularly exciting. But each one, each one deserves a morning in the bathtub because you do need to read them a bit slowly. They're not hard to follow. They're quite clear, and they're um, they're amusing and they're absorbing. I, I find I really think all of these stories are worth reading. One one a day in the bathtub. Text for nothing is almost like him starting to under trying to figure out a lot of the things he wants to do in later work. You'll like actually see some names like Pazzo, Pazzo, or whatever his name was from Waiting for Godot. What else? You'll see him. The other thing that's really interesting about these is they're like monologues, often monologues from the plays, which if you look at them on, on the page are not particularly exciting, but there's something about Beckett which really is made to be spoken aloud. And all of these, these are very like short little monologues. And I think they would actually be good little dramatic pieces. I'm sure people have used them as dramatic pieces. I don't know even where to start. Most of the time, the, again, he's he'll, he pairs back the narrative. There's stories all the way through. They're not philosophical reflections. They're stories. And they start off with one idea, 
One is about, I'm trying to remember if this is the one I'm thinking about, is about somebody who just starts to think, look at himself and asks himself where that's leading him. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of looking at himself, characters looking at themselves and hearing themselves talk and being this presence in the back of their own brain. You'll see a lot of this in these stories. And hearing the words come out of the mouth of this person that's, that's in front of them. But they're in the back, this kind of almost inert force that is going to, you know, is, it's almost like death, its own death. And watching these words come out of the mouth. And the words that come out of the mouth of all the characters in Text for Nothing is nothing. It's nothing. It's words that just come out of this body, which is, you know, eating and defecating. I, I'm making it sound much more depressing. <laughs> <laughs> but this this kind of endless process of the body trying to move forward. And every time you have progress in Beckett, it's kind of ironic. It's iron ironicized. So you'll move forward, fail better, isn't that from Beckett? Fail better, you just keep going and going, and then you die. And you go back to this voice in the back of your head, and they all go together. So there's a lot of that in these little stories. I wanted to read just a real short passage from the beginning of, this is 22 of this edition, John Calder did these really nice, he was he was Beckett's publisher in London, and he does a lot of these short books, which is the perfect way to read these short fragmentary pieces. Again, not fragmentary, these short little pieces of Beckett. Um, and they're nice little volumes to read them in. And these texts for nothing belong together. This is number four. Where would I go? If I could go, who would I be? If I could be, what would I say if I had a voice? Who says this, saying it's me? Answer simply. Someone answer simply. It's the same old stranger as ever, for whom alone accusative I exist. In the pit of my inexistence, of his, of ours, there's a simple answer. It's not with thinking he'll find me, but what is he to do, living and bewildered, yes, living, say what he may. Forget me. Know me not, yes, that would be the wisest, none better able than he. Why this sudden affability after such desertion? It's easy to understand, that's what he says, but he doesn't understand. I'm not in his head, nowhere in his old body, and yet I'm there. For him I'm there. With him, hence all the confusion. So the, the conflict and the moment of the story starting is this character asking about his relationship to this being he's part of. And it, again, he, I can't describe more than this kind of this rudimentary thing in the back that is simply watching the other part of himself try to be alive, try to be loving. And the uh, the difficulty of trying to even describe that relationship. And these are really powerful little stories that if you get that little first premise, takes us forward to a conclusion. Every one of them has a conclusion. It's based on that premise. And they're, they're emotional. They're character-driven, like any good fiction. And they are narrative. So you, it's there. There's a lot of talk about how no one goes anywhere, and Beckett and is existential, and no one, everyone's just trying to achieve, and nothing gets done. Don't think about any of that stuff. Each one of them has a really strong, little, very tightly focused narrative interests, and he plays with these different narratives in a lot of different ways. So I thought we, and and you, he starts to go further and further into almost the most minimal uh, effect upon the character. So you, you can almost watch the three novels. It publishes three novels. And I, uh, it's Malloy, Malone Dies, and uh, The Unnameable. And that character basically, you know, that first person sort of narrator who's different in each book, becomes more inert in each book. Um, Malloy is the best of my think, and I want to do Malloy again soon. So I thought, for fun, we'd try to read through little bits and pieces of Beckett. There's a few of the novels I haven't actually read yet, some of the late stuff. And I, de I definitely want to do Malloy. He's definitely good in the bathtub. I've read that a few times. And the three novels by themselves are worth reading. So I would, I would suggest this is the first place to go. Try this.
and and then watch the plays. I won't talk about the plays. So that's a you can't you can't go to the play in the bathtub. This is this is this is doing the stuff he does in the plays, but for that individual reader. And I really recommend this book. It's it's it'll, it'll it will absorb you. And then try some of the little small books. But this one, if you were going to read any of these kind of the smaller, more experimental pieces, text for nothing, really grows on me over the years. And uh, again, I'm sorry I haven't said anything really fascinating about him, except that I really like reading him in the bathtub. Okay, I guess that's it. And uh, was there anything else exciting I had to say? Uh, I had some med ideas, but I'm not going to do those. Um, and uh, one of the things is, is that the idea of again, narrative as an experience and you, the stories about the character's experience in time moving forward, and it's just the experience of Beckett. The life of experience is this heavy, heavy weight, just inertia of the body and the brain, this inability to move. It's inability to move very far. And that's what he writes about well and tragically and comically, both at the same time. And, and forget all the rest of that. Don't don't read any books about Beckett. All right. Um, happy reading. I'll see I'll see you in the bathtub.